Unreal Engine 5.2 has a lot of really cool stuff. We thought we'd go over it uh, from the perspective of an indie dev team, talk about the cool things that we think we can take advantage of and what you guys might find cool in your projects as well. So let's get into it. So the first thing we wanted to look at is PCG, procedural content generation. I think it looks pretty cool. So for the past like year, I've been getting really heavy into procedural yeah. generation. I was actually initially looking into Blender geometry nodes. And then since I've kind of gone full into Houdini, um, and it's really cool to see another competitor in the space because Houdini has kind of had the, they've been the, the monopoly on this area for like a really long time. So it is cool that that there, there are some other people in the space kind of forcing innovation right. and everything. So I watched some stuff about the PCG system in Unreal, and it actually reminds me a lot more of geometry nodes than it does Houdini. It's kind of like the the natural progression because they already have like node-based things, like an, a node-based interface for right. blueprints, blueprints and everything. So it kind of just works where they can kind of bootstrap that system like PCG is kind of following that trend of everything in terms of software development is moving towards um, authoring tools, N much less Seems, yeah. hand um, hand placing things or hand building something. Yeah. So when I was using Blender geometry nodes, I basically just kind of gave up on it because if you would run into something where there wasn't a node that you needed like already created, then you're just kind of out of luck. Really, if you want to take this kind of procedural content generation stuff seriously, why not go ahead and use the industry standard and the tool that is the best at doing that specific thing? Yeah. If you want to do something, there's typically a tool specifically for that thing. Mm -hmm. Don't waste your tr time trying to force something to work in a, in a piece of software that doesn't specialize in that. Yeah. And Houdini is the king of procedural content yeah. creation. With that said though, I would say that PCG will work really well if what you're doing fits within kind of like a category. So if you're doing like simple things, I don't want to have to to place my fence, every piece of my fence by hand. PCG would be perfect for some like smaller tools. That's the advantage that PCG has is that it's integrated directly into the engine. So potentially PCG could be a good like gateway for people getting into it to learn content generation and to do simpler tools. And then if they need something more complicated, then they could switch to Houdini and do that. Houdini is a very complicated program. You'd get up to speed a, a lot faster with PCG. Okay, so the next thing that we want to talk about is the new material system called Substrate. Unreal has said is going to be the new standard eventually. They're mm -hmm. going to transition everything over to Substrate yeah. and no longer use the traditional PBR workflow. I mean, it is still PBR. They're trying to make it as physical as possible. You went from like your really simple shading pre-PBR yeah. and then PBR came around and it's like, oh, now we've got these like physically accurate properties. Look at the but... difference between Uncharted 3 and Uncharted 4 that Uncharted 4 was one of the first games to do PBR. And you can tell that dramatic difference in how realistic mm -hmm. the surfaces are. But even with PBR, supposedly a lot of the properties that you have in PBR are kind of like made up. PBR is, is some things are kind of whatever, gamey in a sense. But then with this new substrate system, from what they've been saying, everything um, is actually accurate. If you actually want to make like a gold material that they were showing, you actually put in the physical properties of gold. What the advantage of this sounds like is that you're adding in the third dimension to materials. Now you're not only working with a 2D image, you have layers to it. You have so depth. That's... So with, with the layers, like you're saying, like it was cool, the demo that they had, there was like a thin film and then underneath that film, there's like another material. And if you get the, the properties right for each layer, then like the light, you know, enter that thin film and react properly with that and then hit like 
yeah. the material underneath it and then right. do whatever. Yeah, it looks it looks really cool. I'm not like the, the, the biggest shader person, so I don't understand a lot of it. So, MetaHuman Animator. I see through your darkness now. The way that this works is actually very similar to another system that we were looking into with Unity, which is um, Ziva. And essentially, the way that Ziva works is you have a whole bunch of 4D capture data of a face going through like all the physically possible movements of the human face. Mm -hmm. You capture all that data as individual models, and then they create a machine learning like network, neural network that then allows you to essentially search all these different heads to get the closest one that represents your input. So like, let, let's say that I had a camera pointing at my face and I do some sort of expression. That image would be fed into the neural network, which would then search through all the possible heads and then find the one that closestly matches my expression. MetaHuman Animator seems to be very similar from what they've said. The demo that they used um, on stage they just used an iPhone camera mm -hmm. and got the LiDAR data within a minute, translated it into a fully animated character. And yeah, it looks crazy. crazy amazing, which is a little concerning to me because I highly doubt it's that good looking every well, single time. I mean, Epic has had so much of Fortnite money. They've funneled it into right. all these different technologies. But anyways, initially we were wanting to, to create our own uh, 40 capture kind of like stage where it, where you'd sit in a chair and then the, the actor would perform and it would capture 30 different pictures. We would put that into a photogrammetry, uh, do like a batch process to run through and create all the different heads that we need for the animation. But it's a lot of work to create the system, to do all the processing. So this, we are seriously thinking about using this because it would not only dramatically reduce like our R&D time, but then it would also, it would allow us to um, get a lot faster turnaround yeah. on, our, on our animations. And we would be able to have this run in uh, real time along with the body performance. I mean, obviously we're gonna have to run some tests to verify that this is high quality enough. At the very least, this is gonna be great for um, crowd generation. We can sure we yeah. can create hundreds of characters uh, super easily. Okay, so the next thing is kind of cool. So Epic is developing a new programming language called Verse, and it plays in the whole like metaverse thing. Essentially, this programming language is meant for the metaverse. They're they're kind of comparing the metaverse to the internet. The internet as having all these different websites that, 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 that all kind of, kind of connect to each other and you're like browsing the internet, you know, through all these different um, servers and everything. So their idea of the metaverse is the same thing, where there's going to be a ton of different games and experiences that are all kind of connected to one another in this like digital landscape. Like how, realistically, how is that gonna happen? You as like a Fortnite character, can literally just like so, leave Fortnite and walk into freaking PUBG? I guess, sort of. So maybe, I don't know. They're trying to make this new programming language the like JavaScript of the metaverse. So JavaScript is like web, web development. Yeah. yeah. And everybody uses it. It's used for everything. Yeah. Um, so they're making a new programming language for the metaverse that will be anal analogous to JavaScript. They're, they're creating it from scratch because it's going to be super tailored for this like new thing that's never really happened before. Uh, so if they were to go with older languages, there'd be a lot of old dependencies with things. And um, yeah, this just gives them a nice clean start. And just a side note, I had no idea how nerdy Tim Sweeney, what's his name? Todd? Wow. Tim, it's Tim something. Tim, I thought it was Sweeney. Yeah, it's it's Tim Tim Sweeney. Sweeney. Why does that sound like a know. character from a movie? He is a Dude, mega nerd. He is Holy cool. <laughs> cow! That is the kind of person you want in charge of like a, a technology company. Right. When you look at those presentations they do for like Apple, Dude. those hip guys with the turtleneck shirts and stuff that are like showing off the new iPhone. 
you don't trust those guys to really know what they're talking about. Somebody like Tim Sweeney, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. This, this is the kind of man you want to follow. Mm. When they were talking about this, it reminded me a lot of uh, Docker. So Docker is this kind of framework where you can, you can package things um, into a container. That's kind of their, their goal with some of the, the technical stuff, how it works behind the scenes. Or Which, maybe it's just like Ralph Breaks the Internet, your little avatar character that gets in your car and drives to a different website. There you go. <laughs> That's going to be really interesting if we are saying that this is more like a like a literal landscape of games mm -hmm. or like 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 the internet, then people are going to try more than they are now to make games that have certain things in common with other games so they can be adjacent to them mm -hmm. in a way. People are going to be making games that are almost like um, in contribution to a bigger game so that people will start to like have like bleed or it's, it's almost like YouTube collaborations or YouTube commentary kind of things where it's like here's like mm. here's like a music video yeah. and then here's all of these YouTube channels that review music videos. Okay, so the the next thing I haven't really looked into much uh, there's it's fab. Yeah, Fab is interesting because basically Epic is trying to make a one-stop shop for content creation in a video game. That's why <clears throat> recently they've been buying up things like ArtStation, mm -hmm. Sketchfab, Quixel, all of these things. Basically, they're trying to merge all that together and make the Walmart for video games, <laughs> which it is cool. And it's a, it's a really good idea, and it almost is kind of necessary, but it is a little bit of a concern for us as game developers and gamers, actually maybe more gamers than game developers, because what's going to be happening if Fab becomes popular is that every game is going to become Similar. the same. Well, They're all going to look the same. They're all going to feel the same. It's almost like what happened to Unity back in the early 2010s. Everybody's like, ew, it's a Unity game. I don't want to play that because it's just an asset flip. But maybe that will happen for a short period of time until people kind of get wise to it. And then people are going to start diverging again and right. becoming more unique. It's going to be interesting because people will start to recognize assets in games yeah and it, it's yeah. almost like uh back in the day when they did a lot of prop models for movies uh they called them greebles so they would buy model kits from like a world war ii plane and then they, they'd have like a handful of pieces that were like super versatile that they would just take out and then they, they'd use those to put on the spaceship or whatever so, so you can look across a whole plethora of movies that are using those same little parts. Once people start to develop the right way to use it, that's how True. it's going to work. Okay, You're going to recognize little pieces here and there, but it'll still have its own cohesive art direction. But it, it'll be kind of fun to see eventually there will be like, oh, hey, there's the famous mug. There's the famous toilet that everybody yeah. uses. So the last thing is Unreal for Fortnite. <laughs> which is like the Unreal Engine that they forked specifically for Fortnite. Yeah. Which, which is kind of cool. At first I thought, oh, they're just trying to do the Roblox thing, but it is like more than that. This is like the new Gary's mod. I mean, even more than that. Is, I feel like this uh, Unreal for Fortnite could be the next Half-Life 2 modding mm -hmm. craze from yeah. the early 2000s. Because, I mean, you've got CSGO, that was a Half-Life mm -hmm. mod. You've got Portal, a Half-Life mod. There are a whole slew of games that were Half-Life mods, and hopefully this Unreal for Fortnite is that next generation of people saying, hey, I can make a game really easily, and at, maybe it won't be super polished or look amazing, but it's a new idea from a new creator. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sick. I think Unreal is really going in the right direction. I'm super excited that they're the people who got super rich 
and then actually did something cool with all their money, right? Um, because they very well could have done like a Call of Duty. Like if, if you think about Call of Duty, they had so much money from their, their, their early Call of Duty games. Mm -hmm. And then most recently they've, they've had a resurgence with uh, Warzone and this like, you know, newest generation of Call of Duty games, but they haven't really done anything cool. All they've done is they, they just kept iterating on their own game. They haven't really expanded and done all these cool technologies. But Unreal, they had so much money that they got from Fortnite. And then they, they funneled it all into these awesome projects. Yeah, because actually, if you think about it, Epic is looking way into the future. Tim Sweeney is like the Elon Musk of, <laughs> yeah. of uh, video games. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really looking far into the future and seeing like, okay, how can we help the next generation of game developers and make the best possible stuff. Anyhow, if you guys uh, have any thoughts about things that we missed or any kind of opinions on the things that we talked about, definitely leave them in the comments. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.